you guys hear what we were singing? If you're... <laughs> Wonderful Savior. You know, if you want to know what generosity is, that chorus, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. That's really, you could really use that as a definition for generosity um, that we're going to get into today. Uh, really good to be with you guys. If you don't know who I am, I'm Danny. I don't want to tell you my last name because it'll be confusing. Um, I'm married to Caitlin, who's the children and family's pastor. It's really an honor to be here. Again, I spoke a couple months ago, um, and obviously, hopefully, it wasn't. So, you guys hearing that? I'm going to see if they can figure it out. All right. We're continuing this generosity series. You guys with me? You ready to give all your money? <laughs> yeah, not so much, right? Uh, Mark kicked it off last week, and Mark really talked about, uh, he gave a biblical foundation for generosity, that, that there's a biblical mandate towards generosity. And the simple reason is because God is generous, he's calling us to be generous as well. And he talked about that we're actually stewards and managers and not really owners, right? And both uh, Mark and Dan quoted the uh, Psalm 24 passage, right? Of the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and everything we have belongs to God. And he did an incredible job. And what I'm going to do this week is I want to take it, we're going to take it one step further. We're going to take this a little bit deeper um, and talk about maybe a bigger definition of what is generosity really all about? What is God really calling us to? Because I, I think we would all agree that God is calling us to be generous. I don't think anybody would deny that. Practically how we live gets a little bit more difficult if we're being honest, right? I know everything is the Lord's, but I don't like necessarily want to, if I'm honest, give it all to him. That's difficult, right? So I want to start by sharing a little story. I grew up um, yeah, with a couple rules. This is the first one, which I still live by. Don't spend money you don't have, right? I mean, how many people do we know that just spend? This is so bad. So don't spend money. If you don't know that, don't spend money you don't have. Don't go into debt. And a general kind of principle I kind of had, and Kaylin and I had going into our marriage was, well, we're going to give to the Lord because, man, there's the biblical mandate to do that. And we want to give God a tithe. We want to give him 10%, right? And if we can, we want to save 10%. So we're kind of like, we live off 80, we give God 10, we try to save 10. Anybody try to do that, right? And we didn't make a lot of money. We got into ministry, and you don't get into church ministry if you want to make a lot of money, just so you know. So there were times when we, we always gave, and we felt very honored to do that. And, you know, in the back of my mind, sometimes it'd be like, man, we could have like a sweet car if we just like didn't tithe, you know? But it was like, okay, God, this is yours. We didn't always save because we didn't always have enough money to save, but we always gave. And that was kind of our, our general principle. And we didn't do it because if we gave God 10%, then God was obligated to give us 15% back. It wasn't like Christian karma where if you put in 10, then God is, has to bless me financially. That's not how this thing works. Uh, but what happened is a few years ago, uh, we were down in Orange County. We went down there to help be part of a church plant. I won't go into all the details, but um, we found ourselves in a financial hardship for the first time ever, where we were hustling. Like, we were straight hustling. Caitlin had a couple jobs. I had like three jobs. I mean, I was doing website work. I was guest preaching places, guest worship leading. I was a meat cutter at a grocery store, and I still have my fingers, right? I was so freaked out that I was gonna cut a finger off, especially as a guitar player. Um, but we were doing everything we could, and we still couldn't make it. And we had these tough conversations of what do we do, God? We are working so hard. We don't have enough to, to pay our monthly bills, let alone tithe. Do I go into debt to give God 10? Like, do I put it on my credit card bill? Does God want me to go into debt to give to him? Right? What do we do? How do we give God? We want to be generous. We knew that God had called us to be generous because God is generous. But we didn't have the ability in that season to give to him. And that was hard because it was like a pride thing, right? It's all these things, can we not provide? So we had to find ways as we worked through these questions, no, we're gonna give, but in this season, we don't, maybe we can't give financially in the way that we would like to, but there are other ways to give. And one of the ways that was is still a value to us is our home. We would get people in our home all the time. We love to gather people. Well, we don't have a lot of money, but we gotta eat, and other people gotta eat. 
So we can just invite people over, we can share a meal, we can play games, we can hear people's stories, we can pray, we can get in the Word and do, we can do all these things in our home, you know, and that doesn't cost us a lot of money, but we're opening our home and we're trying to give with the gifts that God has given us. Kaylin would babysit kids, we'd offer to our friends, hey, we want, let us watch your kids so you can go out on a date. Hey, if someone wants to move, I'm going to actually volunteer to help you, right? Those are ways to give, right? We started thinking differently, and it really changed our life. Because generosity is about more than money. And we know it is, but I don't know that we always think of those kinds of things as giving, See, whether, whether you have a lot of money or a little money, whether you live in a little apartment or a big house, whether you have a lot of time or a little bit of time, your call, if you're a Christ follower, is the same as mine, is to be generous. And it's not dependent on those things. So here's the really cool thing. And this is our family service, like Mark talked about. So there's kids in here, so there might be a little more noise, and we're totally cool with that, right? I wish we passed out the, the crayons and stuff every week, because then we could all draw. Um, but this is for everybody. Right? My five-year-old son has the opportunity to give. The oldest person in this room has the opportunity to give. Everybody here has something to give. Everybody. Generosity is more than money. Well, why is it more than money? So I want to kind of just really hit this home, and then we're going to end up in Acts, and we're going to work through a story that I think is going to give us a lot of practical elements of what does it really mean to live like a daily life of generosity? Why is generosity more than money? So check this out. According to Google, and Google's always right, right? <laughs> I'm not talking about Wikipedia, I'm talking about Google. Uh, there are uh, over half of the population, over 3.5 billion people world, worldwide live in poverty. And let's assume that that number is pretty true for the Christian world. We're talking worldwide. Okay, so that would mean that over half of the Christian population worldwide is living in poverty. And I'm not talking about, man, I can't afford to get the newest iPhone poverty. I'm talking about, I'm hoping to have enough food for my family to eat and a place to live, right? A shelter, that kind of like poverty. So let's assume that's true. Let's assume that over 50% worldwide of Christians are, are struggling financially. That means that 50% of the Christians in the world cannot give financially. Not because they don't want to, but because they actually can't. They have nothing to give financially. So if there's a biblical mandate to give and it's just financial, then 50% of the world's Christians are disobedient to God. Does that sound right to you? Yes? yes. yes. Wait. Indeed. I think it's no, but I'll take it. <laughs> it should be no, right? That's not right, right? Do you ever see in Scripture God condemning the poor for not giving money to him? You can answer, say, no. Try it. Well, it's cool, you guys. It's early. I should have had you guys stretch. <laughs> you know what? It's okay. I, I forgive you guys. Let me, let me say it like this. Generosity is about allowing the grace of God to flow through our lives and onto other people. It is about becoming a highway for God's resources, for heaven's resources to flow through your life. That does include money, but it's not only money. Because if it was only money, then half of the world can't participate. Then statistically, half of this room can't participate. Then our kids can't participate. Any struggling college students, they can't participate. Anybody on really, really fixed incomes, you can't participate. You, know, you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to make it obvious that it has to be more than money. God wants more than just 10% of your income. Think about the songs we just sing. Think about communion that we're going to take later. Is our response, God, you've done so much. I'm just going to give you the bare minimum, and then I can do whatever I want. Right? No. That's not what our response should be. Check out this verse in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. There, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Paul's talking about sexual immorality in this passage. But the point is the same, is that, guess what? You were purchased. Everything that you have, everything that you are, everything that you are going to be belongs to the Father because he purchased you 
by the blood of his son, Jesus. See, we're not our own. And Mark established this last week, right? Everything I, I own belongs to God. Our very core, we, we just didn't get the memo, I think, sometimes. But we talk about it like, God, I, I gave my life to Christ. We use the language. But I want to encourage us today and challenge us, are we living that thing out? That we look at our lives and our giving as more than just financial. If generosity is about more than money, right, if it's, if it's an all-encompassing life thing, then that means that generosity actually becomes about the heart, right? God always works from the inside out. See, it's possible for me to write a check to uh, say there's some need. I could write a check because it's the right thing to do or it's a tax write-off, right? Uh, but my heart isn't necessarily changed. It's just something I do. It will be difficult for any of us to live a full life of generosity with a, with a hard heart. You can't do that without your heart being changed by the grace of God. You could just maybe give, but to have your full life changed to the point that you're impacting the people around you, you need your heart to be changed. Proverbs 4.23 says this, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Everything that we are is flowing out of our heart, right? The way that we love people, the grace that we give, the mercy, the forgiveness, those things come from the inside out. Generosity is the same way. Generosity starts in here with the realization of God has given me so much. I've been given so much. Everything that he's done for me and allowed me to do is a gift. And who am I to hold that thing back from other people? See, there's a biblical foundation for the heart. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn, it'll be on the screen as well. But this is going to be from Psalm 51. And I just want to read a couple passages so that if God is about more than just our external practices, the heart really matters. And God has always, from the very beginning, been after our hearts. In Psalm 51, this is going to be at verse 16. David says this in the context of this, of this, uh, of this psalm. It's kind of sad. So David uh, has an affair with Bathsheba, right? That's a first no-no. Then he kills her husband to hide it. Don't do that. And then eventually the child dies. So this is a, David's in a really dark place. He's in a really dark place. And in verse 16 and 17, he says this to the Lord. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings my sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, O oh God, will not despise. What is David saying here? He's saying, God, you set up the sacrificial system. God is the one who told them to make offerings, right? And all these things in law. He set that up. But David knows that if my heart's not right, those sacrifices aren't really going to mean much. The sacrifices were always meant to get to the heart of man. Right? If they just do the sacrifices and the heart's not being, if the heart's not being shifted, then it's just a sacrifice. And David's saying, God, it's not going to matter. What matters to you is a broken and contrite heart. Another passage that does the same thing is in Jeremiah 31. This is verse 33. Jeremiah gives this prophetic word of the new covenant, this thing that we live in today. And he says this, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after this time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. See, God is always going after the heart. And check this out, church, this is awesome. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. We live in a time when the Holy Spirit resides in us if we're Christ followers. On our own, we don't have the ability to live completely generous lives. It's just too difficult. But with the power and spirit of God, we can. We won't do it naturally, but with the spirit, we can. See, generosity flows out of the inner person. It flows from the inside out. And when we allow God to work in our hearts, we learn that God is not really about rules and percentages, but about allowing his grace to flow through your life. So you, I'm not, this is not an anti-tithe conversation. I just want to make sure, like, this isn't, I promise, Mark. You guys should still give, okay? You know, I hope, you know, a personal goal, I hope that one day I can give 30 or 40% of my income away. I think that would be incredible. But what I want to say is generosity is not dependent on what percentage of your money you can give. 
But if we're trying to give 100% of our life to God and to offer that to other people, which I got to tell you is a lot harder than writing just a check. But the good news is that everybody gets to participate in that. We get one of the best examples. If you want to turn to Acts chapter 3, we get one of the best, really clear examples of this in the New Testament. And the, the quick lead up to this is that the Holy Spirit's been poured out, right? You guys remember that Pentecost thing? Tongues of fire, crazy tongues, duh, 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 duh. Peter preaches the gospel, right? Christ crucified. Thousands of people come to Jesus, right? Yes? All right, there we go. Need a little something. Then we get the end of Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47, that beautiful passage where they're, they're worshiping, they're praying, they're breaking bread together, meaning they're taking communion in these banquet tables. They're sharing, they're selling properties, and they're awe and wonder, and, and they have all this favor, like this beautiful thing that we're like, can we just do that all the time? You know, everyone... That's what's happening. And then we get into chapter three. So if you have your Bibles, it's on page 993. Okay. (laughs) Hear the word of the Lord. Here we go. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple called Beautiful. The temple gate called Beautiful, sorry where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Verse six, then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk, boom. It doesn't say boom, I added that. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped up to his feet. He began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. Isn't that an incredible story? I would love to have one of these circumstances at some point in my life, right? Especially if you're a pastor, you're like, I would love to be like, come on, just, I hope, but man, I don't know. It's a gutsy move. This story highlights what generosity is all about. The story highlights that generosity is not limited to money. It's just not. And I want to really give us four practical kind of essentials to daily generosity. I want us to be able to walk away today with the, uh, like four things that we could be thinking about daily that would help us actually take a step into living generous lives. That's much bigger than just our finances. So the first one happens at verse one. The first thing is this, seek God daily. We have to seek God daily. We talked, I think last time I preached, I talked about being rooted in scripture. Just do that whole thing. We don't have to get all into it, but root yourselves in God's presence. See, Peter and John were on their way to the temple. They're on their way up to go worship. They're on their way up to go pray. They're in the midst of just seeking God and this opportunity presents itself. See, they had already postured their hearts saying, God, work in and through our lives. Say, they had set their lives before the Lord and said, God, whatever you want to do, however you want to interrupt my day, I'm here. But we're going to go praise you, and we're going to go pray, and we're going to go be with other people and do that. In the midst of this miracle, in the midst of that, this incredible opportunity happens. See, they have the posture of Isaiah in chapter 6. Remember that? Isaiah sees the Lord lifted up, the train of his robe fills the temple, and God's like, who are we going to send? And Isaiah says, Here I am, Lord, send me. They have that kind of posture of God, whatever you want to do. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means kind of some basic things. And I'm not going to tell you how this has to look, but you need to meet with the Lord daily. It doesn't mean you have to read 10 chapters of the Bible. Maybe you need to take a walk. You know, something I do every Sunday, I take my dog for a walk super early. There's no one else out usually. It's peaceful. I talk out loud to God. People probably think I'm crazy, but luckily there's no cars. Um, and it's really peaceful. And I like really have a chance to meet with the Lord. It doesn't have to be the same every day, but you should get in the word. You should pray. You should posture yourself before the Lord so you can say something like this. 
God, how can I be generous today? How can I be generous towards my family? Maybe you're a father. How can I be generous towards my kids today? Maybe I could get up a few minutes earlier and so I have an extra 10 minutes with them before I go to work. Maybe you're a son. Maybe you're my kid who's seven years old. Maybe he could do something for the family without being asked to do it, right? Maybe he could feed the dog, whatever. There's, there's little things that we could all be doing to be generous. Say your friends, you could text a friend. Just encourage them. Or your coworkers, right? Maybe you could sit with someone different at lunch. Maybe the person, like, you should know their name. <laughs> you don't, it's been years. It's awkwardly past the time when you can ask their name. Maybe you just go for it, right? And you say, hey, bro, can I buy you some Del Taco? Whatever, right? <laughs> I don't know what your day looks like. Maybe it's on your drive to work. Try to be generous there. Let somebody merge in. That's difficult for me, <laughs> right? I'm not even gonna get to the debate of what the blinker thing is and, oh my gosh, right? Here's what I want to say. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, there are good works prepared for you to do for the Lord. Before the foundations of the world, he set things in motion for you to do each day to give him glory and honor. There are opportunities every day. So we got to seek him to posture our hearts to be ready. Second thing is you got to keep your eyes open. This is verses four and five. Peter looks straight at the man, as did John, and Peter says, look at us. The guy's looking away. He says, look up at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to receive something. This one's powerful because we can go through life like this. Like sometimes we need to, I know we use this metaphor different ways. So sometimes you need to have blinders from like sin and stuff. But in this metaphor, We can go through life sometimes just so close. Like you go to work, you do your thing, you see your people, I give my 10%, I only serve in this ministry, and God's saying, take the blinders off. Like look around. What are the needs? Let me break your schedule. See, we gotta see the world the way that God sees the world. See, God sees worth and value in every single person on this planet. Every person is of value to him even the people we really have a hard time with, right? He loves them. Every ounce of brokenness is opportunity in Jesus' eyes. You're not gonna do that naturally. I'm not gonna see the world like that naturally. There's no way. But with the spirit of God living inside of us and us seeking him and praying, we might start to see there's opportunities all around us. There's a verse in Psalm 119 that I love, verse 36 and 37, it says this, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. Give me life in your ways. I challenge you to meditate on that this week. God, incline my heart towards your word, towards your presence, God, and not towards things that just benefit me. Things that are only good for me. God, help me to look at the things that benefit you and your glory. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things to see the people that are already in my life, God, that I could be generous towards. God, open my eyes. See, selfish eyes look at people for profit. I'm not talking about business profit. It's good for your business to profit. I'm talking about looking at people with the idea of what can they do for me? But generosity looks to give value and worth to people. It looks to give them value, to give them worth, to see them and give them dignity, not to say, what can I take from them for my own benefit? You can't be afraid to look them in the eye. Let me give an example. I'm gonna be vulnerable with you guys right now. So you can judge me, but I'm pretty sure other people do this too. I'm gonna find out. So, all right, you got a broken sprinkler, right? You ran over with a lawnmower, your kid kicked it. I don't know why kids kick the sprinklers. So you got to go to Home Depot. You guys with me? Going to Home Depot, you just need the sprinkler. You go in, you get your sprinkler. You've been there like 30 times already, but this time you're hoping it's the last trip, right? You're coming out. Who do you see? And I apologize, you see the solar guy. I hope nobody here works for a solar, but the solar guy's sitting there, right? And you're like, oh my gosh. So you got your sprinkler and you're like, I just wanna go home. So you do the thing that we all do. We all know what to do. You don't make eye contact. You just like act like you're on your phone. Hey honey, yeah, I'll I'll be be right home. And you just walk by, or you yell out, I'm renting, I'm renting, right? Right, or this is worse, this is even worse. (laughs) You're coming out of a grocery store 
and there's like a kid selling candy or something, right? And you're like, I don't even know if that candy goes to anybody. Is there like a setup? Maybe this, I don't even know what the situation is, right? But all I know is I don't feel like candy. I was sent here just to get one thing. So you walk out and you're like, try not to look at the kid. You feel bad because he's got those eyes. And then you know he's going to be like, and you, you want to buy a candy? And you're like, oh, I, don't have any, I don't have any money. But the kid knows you just bought stuff in the grocery store, right? And you're like, I only have, I don't, I don't have cash. And he's like, oh, I have a swiper. You know, right? So, so, right, you don't want to go through the whole thing, right? So you just like, you just don't make eye contact. Please tell me somebody else does this. Think, we all should repent, right? Peter and John didn't do that. They looked at this man and called his attention to them and said, look at us. See, how many people just avoided this man every day? How many people maybe threw some coins in but wouldn't even look at him? And this guy got so used to that that he wouldn't even look up. He was ashamed. Maybe for years he had been waiting for a miracle, and now he was just hoping for some money. We got to keep our eyes open. We got to give dignity and worth. With God's vision, we're able to see opportunities for generosity. Third thing, this is the big one. Know what you have to give. This is verse six. This is kind of like the pinnacle right of the story. Silver or gold, I do not have, but what I do have, I give to you. See, Peter and John knew what they had. They didn't have to be like, oh, hold on, man. Let me check my first century leather wallet thing. Let me see if I have any money, right? They didn't do that awkwardly where you're like, uh, sorry, man, I don't have anything. They knew they didn't have any money to give. It wasn't like, it was just, we don't have it, man. They didn't have apparently any food or clothing, but they, they knew what they did have. They had the power of Christ and the spirit to heal this man. So do you know what you have to give? See, full life generosity, the kind of generosity I'm hoping to compel us towards, that as a church we want to be compelled towards, is not going to happen accidentally. It's going to take intentionality. It's going to mean we got to take stock of our lives, not just how much money we have in our bank account, but our gifts and our talents, the time that we have. we got to know. So let me give you some examples. Like Kayla and I will do this. We'll go into a week and say, um, what do we have going this week? And oh, you got basketball there, I got soccer, I got a meeting, blah, 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 blah. What nights do we have free? We have, say we have Thursday and Sunday. Then when we say come to church today, we know that if I run into some family, like, hey, you know what, come over. And then you do like, oh yeah, we should get together, I'll text you, and then you never do it, right? You can say, no, come over Thursday. I know we're free. These opportunities are fleeting. Sometimes if we don't take the opportunity, it just goes away. Know what you have to give. Know the commitments you have on the weekend. So if someone says, hey, I need help building a desk for my grandma, I don't know. You know if you have the time to say yes or not. You know if you have the opportunity to step in and fill the need. You know if you have the opportunity to come to like, I don't know, a prayer walk on Saturday morning, right? Which would be super cool. What are your talents? Do you like building stuff? Do you like baking stuff? Do you like sitting with people and having really, really, really long conversations that would kill other people, right? What are those things? If someone came up to me after church and said, hey, Danny, I got this opportunity for you. It's perfect for you. We're, I can't even get this out with a straight face. We, uh, we need a hip hop dance instructor, <laughs> right? And I'd be like, this is super easy. I'm not your guy. I'm not a hip hop dance instructor. But if they said, hey, we need to put a music team together to do some music for this thing, I'd be like, you know what, I'm your guy. I can do that. I have the ability. I know I have the time, whatever, right? This is a silly example. Know what you have to give. I'm going to do another silly plug for our children's ministry, which Mark talked about. We need help. We need help. Middle schoolers or high schoolers, you could serve in our kids' ministry. They would love to hang out with you. People who have grandkids, oh my gosh, they would love for you guys to be in there and be with them. Most of the people serving are all us parents. <laughs> We're with our kids all the time. It'd be sweet to have a little break. That's my little plug. 
But I'm serious. There's opportunity right in our midst as we speak. It's all around if we can just look. What do you have to give? Maybe here's a different way of thinking about it. Mark sent me uh, this link and I thought it was good. Maybe we'll think a little bit more generically. Think about it like this. Be generous with your thoughts. What do you think about? What, do you, what are you meditating on? Be generous with your words. That's a hard one. What are you saying to people? Not just, not just bad words. Are you holding back saying something encouraging to your spouse? Like, hey, you look beautiful today. I don't know if I tell you that enough. Or a friend who you know is going through something. Just, I'm, I'm just thinking about you. Maybe you don't know what to say. You don't have to know what to say. Say, I'm praying for you. Be generous with your time. What are we spending our time? Maybe you could not binge watch that thing on Netflix for the next 18 hours and go be with live people for a little bit, right? Be generous with your attention, with your stuff. Let people borrow your stuff. People need stuff. Be generous with your influence. There are people in every one of our lives that care what we think about them. Are we taking that seriously? The last thing is this. In verse seven, uh, they reach down and they grab the man's hand. They take this leap of faith to actually be generous. We have to take the leap of faith at some point to actually be generous. At some point, you gotta sign up for kids ministry or you gotta invite someone out for coffee or you gotta invite someone into your home or you gotta stop when you see the guy uh, on the overpass and you gotta actually bring him food. Whatever the thing, at some point, we actually have to take the step forward to do the thing. And it's always scary, friends. It's always gonna cost you something. If it doesn't cost you something, it's not sacrifice, I can tell you that. And it might be awkward sometimes. It could very easily that uh, John and Peter could have reached out and nothing could have happened. I don't know. I don't know if they knew there was some guarantee that this was gonna work. We find out in chapter four that this man was 40 years old. He's been sitting at that gate for a long time, which means this. It's very, very, very possible that Jesus passed by this man a lot, that Peter and John actually had seen this man before. And they might be thinking, man, we've seen this guy before. <laughs> like, why didn't Jesus heal him? If Jesus couldn't heal him, how, like, we're not Jesus. How are we going to, right? Who knows, right? We don't know, but at some point, you just got to take the leap of faith and step out in generosity and see God do a work. So why does this matter? Okay, Danny, I understand we should be generous. We should be generous with our money. We should be generous with everything. Like, I get it. But why does it really, really matter? Two reasons. The first is this, Matthew chapter 25. Jesus gives his parable when he talks about this kind of final judgment where he separates the sheep from the goats. So we don't have time to read it all. But he says this to the sheep because these are the righteous. He says that they're going to be rewarded because they gave food to those who needed food. They gave water to those thirsty. They, they were with the widows and orphans. They clothed the naked. They visited those in prison. And they're like, when did we, like, when did we do these things to you, Jesus? And this is what the response is of the king in Matthew 25, 40. And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to the, one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Every time we are generous, we are actually being generous towards God. Which also means that every time we withhold from others, we're actually withholding from God. That, I didn't even want to put that on there because it's, it's convicting. But it's true. And this seems to be how God is going to judge the nations one day. The way we are generous towards others is actually us being generous towards God himself. As we get to the last reason, I'm going to invite the band to come, go ahead and come on up. The end of this chapter uh, in, in Acts, this man gets up, he's leaping. He has this miracle. He is praising guys. Can you picture this guy jumping around, flailing like Michael Flatley, Lord of the Dance or whatever the thing is? But what happens is the whole community at the temple, get everyone around there is in awe and wonder at what just happened. Because they know they, that's the guy who has been sitting there for years. And people are in awe and wonder of God. Can you imagine if we lived lives that were so generous individually and as a church that the Chino Valley was in awe and wonder of God because of the way that we were generous? 
That's what I'm going after. It's gonna cost me. It's gonna cost my family. And it's gonna cost any one of us who wants to go after that. But that's how God's gonna, that's how heaven is gonna invade this place. So I wanna ask you today before we pray, what do you have to give? Have you ever really thought about that? Set money right here. What else in your life do you have to give? Let's pray. Father, we are so undeserving of everything that you've given us, God. It's only by grace that we're saved. It's only by grace that we have the very breath in our lungs, God. You've given us everything. And God, we confess we are selfish. We are looking for things that profit just ourselves and our flesh, God. God, we pray that you would melt our stony hearts. God, give us a heart of flesh. Give us a heart that seeks to be as generous to other people as you have been to us. You gave your very son on a cross for us. Who are we to hold anything back from you? But God, we confess it's difficult and you know that, God. You're not here to condemn us. You're here to invite us into a full life of generosity. A life that takes sacrifice, but a life that is absolutely beautiful. A place where, God, you meet the needs of others in ways that we never could have imagined. And these very simple, ordinary things become ways for heaven's resources to come pouring out into this place. God, I pray that you would take away the fear that gets in our hearts, that blocks us and makes us say no, the things that say, we don't have enough, or how are we gonna do this? Or God, take those fears away, and we'll talk more about that in the later weeks, God. But take it away, God, give us the faith to step out and reach down and offer generosity to the people that are in our daily lives. Holy Spirit, we cannot do this without you. Fill us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this is...